Hello, and welcome back to the Claydon Principle for EPC Contracts, a practical guide to contracts, claims and disputes. This is video 350, Acceleration. No, not that sort. This channel hasn't become a motoring channel, debating acceleration times of the Traffic Lights Grand Prix, even though that could be fun. It can be said that there are two types of acceleration, negotiated, that is instructive, or constructive. That is simplistically put, but suffices for present purposes. Negotiated, or more often instructed, acceleration comes about where the contractor is instructed to complete the works earlier than contractually demanded, or, more likely, where the works have fallen behind schedule. Constructive acceleration is different in that it invariably arises where a contractor is unjustly denied an extension of time for completion and is forced to introduce measures of acceleration to complete the works by the date stated in the contract. Acceleration via disruption. Can the owner instruct a contractor to accelerate under certain standard forms of contract? In the absence of express provision or manifest delay on the part of the contractor, or there is specific power, no. Fitted conditions make no such provision in the general conditions, although it would be possible to incorporate them in the particular conditions. NEC forms do include this provision and even include the possibility of bonus payments where successful. Acceleration via negotiation. Where explicit provision is not present, acceleration can be introduced by negotiation towards a formal instruction to change. But note, this is a formal agreement should be in place prior to the commencement of any accelerative measures. This formalization may be expected to include any or all of the following. A revised schedule in detail at the same level of the contract's original demands, a method statement, amended completion date if not to be on a best efforts basis, and costs could be either agreed lump sum or on actual costs, and should consider also the effect on LDs and payment schedule if the latter has been altered. Acceleration constructive. This is a common occurrence and arises in the case where the contractor has been delayed by factors outside his control and probably within the control of the owner, but the owner has refused an extension of time for completion. To avoid LDs, the contractor may be forced to increase resources in an attempt to complete the works by the original date. If the owner or engineer when requested by the contractor makes a determination to the effect that the contractor does have an entitlement to EOT, then the date for completion is amended accordingly and a formal contract change issued to that end. Where the owner or engineer concludes that no EOT is available, the completion date remains as contract and the contractor is expected, perhaps even instructed, to complete by the contractual date. For present purposes, this can be referred to as compressed performance. At this point, where EOT has been denied, the contractor's obligation remains to complete the works by the contractual date or become exposed to LDs. With a ne negative reaction from the owner, the contractor's options are limited. He can either continue with the original schedule, trying to minimise delay where possible, and risk exposure to LDs. These, of course, might later be overturned 
like ADR, that is Alternative Dispute Resolution, and accelerate by reorganization of methods, increase work hours and resources, and seek to recover the additional costs incurred. For the contractor to decide, he needs to know or make a reasonable estimate of how strong is his case for EOT. What is the cost-benefit analysis of acceleration cost versus estimated recovery? I did a video on SWOT tables that might assist with such a decision. His obligations to mitigate. Legal precedents for present purposes can almost be ignored, although interesting. Once you are that deep, both parties have lost. Accelerate or mitigate. The SCL Delay and Disruption Protocol, in its core statement, states, subject to express contract wording or agreement to the contrary, the duty to mitigate does not extend to requiring the contractor to add extra resources or to work outside its planned hours. The contractor's duty to mitigate has two prongs. He must take reasonable steps to minimise the loss, and he must not take unreasonable steps that increase the loss. There remains, of course, the common law duty to mitigate plus any express requirements in the contract. The SEL Delay and Disruption Protocol um, 2002 edition includes in that section on guidance where a contractor accelerates of its own accord, it is not entitled to compensation. If it accelerates as a result of not receiving an EOT that it considers is due, it is not remain recommended that a claim for so-called constructive acceleration be made. Instead, prior to any accelerative measures being implemented, steps should be taken by either party to have the dispute or difference about entitlement to EOT resolved in accordance with the dispute resolution procedures applicable to the contract. The 2016 draft of that same protocol differs in that it no longer refers to so-called constructive acceleration. It simply maintains the principle that the dispute or difference can be resolved prior to implementation of any accelerative measures to avoid any risk of non-compensation. Whether instructed or constructive acceleration is an issue fraught with difficulty. Even when instructed, and even if acceleration be successfully achieved, it can be difficult to demonstrate that additional costs have been incurred over and above the clearly obvious direct costs, such as expedited air freight. The employer's position will often be that any time saved has reduced the contractor's other costs, for example, his establishment costs, head office and other time-related charges. That said, where acceleration is formally instructed, it will be treated as a change under the contract, and here is no more discussed. Employers are often more interested in achieving timely completion than the imposition of LDs, and may seek to exploit the contract to apply pressure on the contractor to complete on time, often citing the general requirements of mitigation, which is separately treated. Where constructive acceleration is the issue, it becomes ever more difficult. First, in convincing the employer that he has indeed constructively ordered acceleration. And secondly, there is no specific doctrine available in English law. English law does not provide a specific recovery path. US practice, but not law, permits it. Where excusable delay does exist, and that delay has been timely notified and EOT requested, that request has been denied or has been delayed by the employer. The employer has ordered the contract to, to, to complete on time 
whether expressly or implicitly, and acceleration has been implemented and actual costs incurred. US courts permit this where the employer ought to have issued such instructions, as in UK English law. As we say, there is no provision suitable for the principle of recovery of costs for constructive acceleration under English law. In such absence, means may be sought to establish entitlement to recover damages by other means under the law. These pr um, possible routes include implied instructions, breach of contract, mitigation. In addition, but beyond the present scope, can be numbered legal avenues including unjust enrichment, law of restitution, economic duress and intimidation, law of tort. Where an employer ought to have issued an instruction under the contract to accelerate, but fails to do so, an English court will generally award compensation, that is damages, as if such an instruction had been properly issued. The breach of contract. Now details of breach are dealt with elsewhere, but for now let it be said that a fundamental breach leads to termination at the option of the injured party where material breach leads only to damages for the injured party. Thus, where an employer fails in an obligation to issue an EOT by delay or outright refusal, thereby forcing acceleration on the contractor, that could be considered as a material breach and damages may be successfully pursued. Mitigation. Most contract demand that a contractor mitigate the effects of delay events of whatever cause. There is thus an obligation to take reasonable steps. In such a case, the reasonable costs of such reasonable steps are recoverable. Thus it can be admitted that where breach by the employer causes the contractor to implement measures of mitigation, whether or not successful, he may be entitled to recover costs with or without specific instructions from the employer. So therefore, in conclusion, it is possible to mount a credible claim for constructive acceleration. The means can be summarised as possible. Where an acceleration clause exists and no explicit instruction has been issued, but should have been issued, there exists a strong case to pursue and one likely to be held, upheld by an arbitrator or court in deeming such to have been issued. Where no acceleration clause exists and the employer has wrongfully or willfully failed to issue the appropriate EOT, a claim is likely to succeed and be upheld by an arbitrator or court. Where, as is usual, a contract demands that in the event of delay, the contractor should mitigate effects, and he has done so, thereby incurring reasonable costs. Such reasonable costs may be recoverable. In preparing this video, I've, put, I've used um, references from the RSS paper of 2015, entitled International Common Law Approaches to Construction Acceleration Claims. What is the solution in the English law? Uh, this was written by uh, Alan Whaley and Brodie McAdam. Lastly, uh, I thank you for watching and ask if you would kindly like, share and subscribe. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you again.